Good morning. And welcome to worship. And we extend that welcome to all of you here today, members and visitors alike, as well as those who might be joining us by means of Facebook as well. Today, this Sunday, is, is oftentimes set aside as Good Shepherd Sunday. A Sunday that probably is very near and dear to the hearts of many a Christian because it pictures our, our Lord and our Savior in that role of his shepherding. A role that, that brings tremendous comfort and, and peace to us as we recognize that he cares for us with the greatest of love and care, so much so that he was willing to lay down his life for us. That's what we will focus on as we gather together for worship here today. This morning we will also be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion. And as you see there on page 3 in the service folder, God's Word comes to us and speaks to us that those who receive the sacrament of Holy Communion are, are making an expression of faith, one that recognizes that Christ's true body and blood is present together with the bread and wine, as well as a unity with those with whom one receives it. Because we cannot read anybody's heart, and we do not seek to read anybody's heart, we ask that members of our congregation and members of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, who we've heard give that public confession of their faith, to be and come forward to receive the sacrament with us today. If anyone would happen to have any questions concerning this practice, please do pull me aside after worship, and I'd be more than happy to, to discuss it with you. And then finally, you will note that today, once again, we will be using setting one, which is the order of service where we, we have to turn to our blue hymnal, um, or follow along as it's projected in front of you. But as we go along through the service, I will point you to those pages in the blue hymnal if you'd like to follow along there. But we begin our worship service with the singing of hymn 551, which we find in the blue hymnal, and we will once again stand for the singing of the final verse. God's blessings on your worship. If you would like to follow along in the blue hymnal, you can turn to page 154 in the front part of it and follow setting one in the order of service for setting one there. Or as I said, you may follow along as it is projected in front of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins 
and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent sufferings and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory be to God on high. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, you are the good shepherd who laid down your life for the sheep. Lead us now to the still waters of your life-giving word, that we may abide in your Father's house forevermore. For you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our lessons this morning direct our attention to Jesus as our good shepherd and the way in which he shepherds us. In our first lesson, 
we see that one of the ways he shepherds us is by giving us under shepherds, pastors. And as the Apostle Paul speaks here in the book of Acts, he encourages, reminds, and teaches those pastors to keep watch of themselves and the flock that God has given to their care. We read from Acts chapter 20. Always keep watch over yourselves and over the whole flock in which the Holy Spirit has placed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves who will not spare the flock will come in among you. Even from your own group, men will rise up, twisting the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be always on the alert. Remember that for three years, night and day, I never stopped warning each one of you with tears. And now I entrust you to God and to the word of his grace, which has power to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The word of the Lord. Our second lesson comes to us from 1 John chapter 4. And here our Lord reminds us that not everybody who comes with the word of God is necessarily having our best spiritual interest in mind, as some come with false teaching. And therefore, we need to be aware, watch out, and match what is said with what God's word says. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit who does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is already in the world. You are from God, dear children, and you have overcome the false prophets because the one in you is greater than the one in the world. They are from the world. That is why they speak from a worldly perspective and the world listens to them. We are from God. The one who knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. That is how we can distinguish between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The word of the Lord. We join in singing the gospel acclamation portion of the service, we find those on page 161 in the front part of the hymnal. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Our gospel lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, reading verses 11 through 18. These words will also serve as the basis for our sermon here this morning. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired man, who is not a shepherd, does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. Because he works for money, he does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I also have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, and one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. 
No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This is the commission I received from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated as we continue with the singing of hymn 552. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from your risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who is also your good shepherd. Amen. This past week, in preparation for our sermon here this morning, I did a little bit of reading in some articles, some blogs, some opinions about what people had to say and what they thought gave indication of when someone really gets you. You know, they, they really know you. They really understand you. 
And I wanted to share with you a few of the things that I ran across that people had to say. They know when to support you and when to leave you alone. They always know the right thing to cheer you up. They never get mad when you criticize them because they understand what you're trying to say. They don't try to change you. They listen when you just need someone to listen. They support you when you need backup. You can be yourself around them. You can tell them anything. There's a lot more articles, a lot more blogs, a lot more opinions that I could have read. But let it be sufficient to say that all of us here in this life would love to have someone in this life who really gets us. I've got good news for you here this morning. You do. You do have someone who really gets you, who really knows you. For did you hear what Jesus said? I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. The Christian friends, Jesus, your good shepherd, knows you. And one of the ways that Jesus, your good shepherd, knows you is he knows that we are, well, sheep. Now, such an illustration, such a reference, would have been something that was very familiar to the people who first heard Jesus speak these words. You see, as he, as he traveled around and people traveled around there in the land of Palestine, the, the picture of sheep and shepherd would have been very commonplace. Much like when you and I travel around, what's very commonplace? The 18-wheeler semi-truck. And so, people knew what sheep were like. So what makes this such a de good description of us? Well, I've got a couple of visual aids here this morning that, that I think will help us drive home that point of why it's such a good comparison. This first one is just a real short little video. Basically. If a sheep rolls over onto its back or falls onto its back, it cannot get up again. It is completely helpless. And within a day of it being on his back, it will die if a shepherd does not make it stand upright again. So do you see the comparison? Your friends, that's the way that we came into this world. We began life in rebellion to God. We, we did not love God. We had no desire to follow God's will. There was no bond of affection between him and us. Spiritually speaking, we were completely helpless. And there was nothing that we could do to change that spiritual condition. If left to ourselves, we were destined to die in hell unless Jesus did something. Another way that, that we are like sheep can be seen perhaps in this picture. Called sheep mentality. So what's sheep mentality? Sheep mentality is that, that idea that describes how one sheep can be influenced by other sheep to simply go along with the flock. For example, one farmer said that if you have a bunch of sheep in a barn and before you open the door, if you tie a rope across the entrance, when you open that door, the sheep in the front will jump over that rope. But if you cut that rope so it's no longer there, the sheep that follow will still jump over the invisible rope because they saw the first sheep jump over it. Once again, do you see why Jesus might use sheep as a description of us? How often haven't we been guilty of just following the ways of this world? 
We see what the world has. We want it too. This is what happens. We, we maybe will ignore the instruction uh, in God's word for our children and instead replace it because that's what the world does with instruction in sports and activities. Or maybe we, we fail to give first fruit, godly offerings to our Lord because, well, the world has all sorts of toys and gadgets and we want those toys and gadgets too. This sheep mentality leads us to think that what will really truly satisfy us is following the ways of this world and having everything the world has. But do you, do you know what happens then? What happens is pleasure becomes our goal, satisfying our wants becomes our aim, and we turn ourselves into our own God. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. like sheep that have rolled over on their back, helpless. Like sheep that are following the crowd, chasing after the pleasures of sin. That's what we are. That's what we do. That's one of the reasons why the Bible describes us as sheep. But remember now, Jesus, our good shepherd, gets us. He knows that we are sheep. But, but understand that Jesus is not saying to us that he supports us in our sinful behavior by saying that he gets us and knows us. He is not saying, well, you just go be you. He is not saying to us, well, don't worry, I won't try to change you. No, you see, Jesus gets us in the sense that he knows what our real problem is. Jesus gets us because he knows what our greatest need is. And our greatest need is not being told, just go be you. Our greatest need is not the best life now. Our greatest need is not all of the things of this world. No, our greatest need is a solution to the problem of sin that dirties us, that contaminates us, that separates us from God, and makes us worthy of hell. Our greatest need is a restored relationship with God. Jesus, your good shepherd, knows your greatest need. But of course, there is a huge difference, isn't there, between knowing what someone's greatest need is and being able to provide for that greatest need. But that's really what makes Jesus our good shepherd. He's able to provide it. Five times here in the words of our lesson that we're looking at, these eight verses of John chapter 10, Jesus says that he lays down his life for the sheep. That's what we needed him to do. Now, when Jesus calls himself the good shepherd here, understand that he's not saying that he's the, the moral shepherd. He's not saying that he's the shepherd that leaves the best example for you to follow. He's not saying that he's this godly and virtuous shepherd. Even though all of those things are true, when he calls himself the good shepherd, he's the good shepherd because he can provide the forgiveness of sins. And the only way that that was going to be able to be accomplished is if he laid down his life as our substitute. That's what makes him different than the hired hand. You see, the hired hand has no investment in the sheep. He doesn't care for the sheep. The hired hand sees himself as being far more important, of far greater value than the sheep. So when danger comes, he runs away to protect his life. Not so Jesus. He sees you as having the greatest value. So valuable are you, in fact, to him that he was willing to lay down his life for you. And maybe you say, well, what value is a, a dead shepherd? I mean, after all, that dead shepherd might save the, the flock from that current danger, but what about the future danger? Because that's where we need to understand 
Jesus did more than just defend us against danger. He died in place of us. You see, his work was substitutionary. That's just how great his love is for us. He gave up his throne in heaven to come down to this earth and take on human flesh. He reached down into the depths of our sinfulness. He rescued us as we were lying there on our back, spiritually helpless. He went to the cross, endured all of the agony there for all the times that we have gone astray. And then, when the danger of hell came, he didn't run away. Instead, he allowed himself to be forsaken by God the Father in order to suffer the punishment that made payment for our sins. His love for you is so strong that he carries the full weight of your sin. His love for you is so strong that he bears the full, full burden of punishment. He carried your sin and your punishment all the way to the cross and laid down his life for you. And there is not another person, not your mother, not your best friend, not your spouse, not even yourself, who could have carried that burden. Only he could. And he did. And then, then he took up his life again. And that empty tomb is proof that sin, death, hell, and the devil, all of the wolves, have been defeated. That empty tomb is proof. It's the bank statement from God the Father that says it's true. Payment has been made. You are forgiven. But your brothers and sisters in Christ, you do not have a dead shepherd. He is very much alive. It isn't that Jesus was your shepherd. He is your good shepherd. He knows you. He gets you. He knows your greatest need. He's able to provide for your greatest need. And Jesus, your good shepherd, also knows what you are going through right now. You stop and think about it. If, if Jesus knows what your greatest need is, then he obviously knows all of your other needs, too. And if he knows what you need to be provided for your greatest need, well, then he obviously knows what you need in your other needs, too. People don't usually wash a rental car, do they? Have you ever thought, why is that? Well, it's because people don't have a long-term investment in that car. You know, generally when people don't have a long-term investment in something, they just don't take as good of care of it as something that they own and have a long-term investment is. But now look at Jesus. When it came time to be defended from our enemies, he didn't run away. Instead, he laid down his life for us. He invested himself in us. And then when the waters of baptism were splashed on our forehead, we were baptized into the name of Jesus. And Jesus put his name on us. He said, you are mine. A relationship was formed. He claimed us as his own. And since he has such an investment in us, we can be sure that he will never leave us. He will stick it out in every situation we find ourselves in life. And that's tremendously comforting. It's assurance that you and I need to hear because there are times, aren't there, that we feel abandoned. Suffering comes into our lives. Problems come into our lives. Difficulties come into our lives. And what does Satan do? Satan comes and says, he doesn't love you. He tries to get you to doubt your faith, to doubt Jesus. 
whether it be a medical problem, a, a job problem, a, a family problem, a personal problem. He tries to get you to ask, well, where is God? Why is he allowing this to happen to me? Why isn't he doing something about this? Where, just where in all of the world is my good shepherd? But you see, that's the reason why God had this picture painted on the portrait and the canvas of Scripture. So that you would know where your good shepherd is. He's right there beside you. He has never abandoned you. And he never will. And at those times when you wonder why isn't he doing something about this, he comes to you and says, I already have. I'm right there holding you safe in my arms, my little lamb. See, I already have done something about all of this. I stretched out my arms on the cross. I laid down my life that you might be forgiven and safe in my arms. You know, they say, a picture speaks a thousand words. My guess is that most all of you here today, if not all of you, have seen a picture like that before. We know what it represents. Jesus, the Good Shepherd. We, the Lamb, safe in his arms. And we can know it's true because he laid down his life for us. We can know it's true because he took his life up again. We can know it's true because he did the unthinkable and he won our forgiveness. And now we can know that he is there providing all that we need in every other situation in life, that indeed you are safe in his arms. Amen. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand as we join together in confessing the Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. 
Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, especially Sherry Bew, who fell last week, broke her hip, and underwent surgery. Thank you for granting success to the surgery. In the days to come, continue to watch over her, protect her, and grant healing to her body. During these days that can be frustrating and wearisome, give her your strength and lift her up with your words of promise. Be her strength, her physician, her greatest friend. And remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Please stand, and we continue with the liturgy for the sacrament that if you are following along in the front part of the hymnal, you can find on page 165. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world and by his glorious resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. O oh Christ, As one personally prepares to receive the sacrament this morning, you may find the inside cover of the red hymnal to be a benefit to you. Please come forward at the direction of the usher, for all is now prepared.
shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take a drink. The true blood of your Lord and Savior shed for you. Now the Shabbat and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you with the wonderful faith of the life of life. Your sins are forgiven. Depart in peace. Amen. We stand, and we conclude on page 170. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. 
Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our final hymn. Jesus, our good shepherd, he knows us. What a marvelous truth that is. He knows us. He knows what our greatest need is. He knows how and he has provided for that greatest need. And since he has, we have the confidence that he will take care of us in all of our other needs as well. He invested himself in us. If anybody ever has truly gotten us, it's Jesus. May you go with that comfort, that peace, and that, that knowledge. A joy once again to worship with all of you here today. Um, that very special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us today um, once again also. Great to see your, your faces. We look forward to the opportunity to worship with you again in, in the future. You see the announcements that are there before you, and I'm going to draw your attention to a couple of them. Um, please take note that youth group will be meeting here today at 1 o'clock here in Black River Falls. Um, Jesus Cares will meet for a worship at the cross this coming Saturday at 1 o'clock here at Black River Falls. Um, take note that next week Sunday is the final day to sign up for a faith t-shirt if you would like one. And then also take note that the voters meeting will be next week. Um, that congregational meeting will take place at our Cataract campus at 12.05. And information that you might like to know about prior to that meeting can be found on the white table in the gathering area. Um, you'll find the financial report, the statistical report. You will also find the outreach report as well as the child protection policy. So if you wanted to be able to look at those things in advance of that meeting, um, I encourage you to grab a copy and, and take one home and look through it. 
And then finally, if you happen to order an Easter lily and would like to take it with you, um, they are in the kitchen and you are welcome to take it home. I, I think that generally what happens is that if it isn't taken after a period of time, um, Brad will plant those out in, in our, on our property. Um, so, so if you don't take them, they will get put to use, but um, if you'd like yours, go ahead and, and grab it. Um, God's richest blessings to all of you, and God be with you until we meet again.